that I want to read. Uh, first off, I want to just start out. I want to read you a couple of things I've written in some notes, and then we'll put some stuff on the board. But uh, last week I talked about, of course, we're in that season now. We call it spring, and in Catholic in uh, Catholicism they call it uh, what do they call it? Easter religion. They call it Easter. In that, if you in uh, Hebrew they call it Passover. Uh, all ancient religions had a terminology that they used for this. Like if you were in, uh, I think, uh, Babylonian, it was called Eshtar, which that's where the word Easter come from. And it was about the, uh, what is it, the planet Venus during this time of year, the six or eight months out of the year that Venus runs in front of the sun, and then several months out of the year that Venus follows the sun. But it was called Venus which is the word Lucifer in Latin. In other words, the bringer of light. And all that meant is astrologically, or uh, perennial philosophy, that's what perennial philosophy was built on all of these nature. Perennial just simply means it repeats itself. If you plant perennial flowers and things that come back on their own. And that's what the perennial philosophy was about, nature philosophy, and this is how nature works. And so it was that that planet would rise in front of the sun. So you could watch it. You could actually watch it and see it coming in front. And so it's like it was, that's why it's called the bringer of light. And if you look in, in Isaiah, that's the only place in the Old Testament you'll find the word, Latin word. It's a Latin word, Lucifer. It's not Hebrew. It's, a, it's translated from the Latin in the King James Bible only. I don't think any other translation uses it. I think it's only the King James that uses that particular phrase. Other translations will, instead of saying Lucifer, they will say light bringer or bearer of light. And it's actually referring to humankind because humankind is the bearer or carrier of light, the light of God. Okay? And uh, so anyway, we're in that season. We're in that time of year. And like I said, in uh, Hebrew, if you look at ancient Hebrew or the Old Testament, analogies, mythologies, tales, stories, whatever you want to call them. It's called Passover. It's where the sun reaches that point every year that it passes the equal mark where the days are 12 hours and 12 hours, day and night, equal. And passes over that to where the days all of a sudden start to move upward and the day gets longer. So the idea behind that is the sun is born again. In other words, it's resurrected and that's what it's called. So all of the ancient mythologies are built on this time of year, this season, and are totally misunderstood by most religionists. Most people that's in religion don't understand it, don't look, don't un, don't see it. And a part of the reason behind that was religion found a way to, to twist the ideologies and make them history, and rather than leave them as a mystery, they twisted them and make them history. Then they can own us and control us through fear Therefore, get our money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they did that, and they have done that for hundreds, even thousands of years. And I, I feel, and I thank God, that we are waking up as a whole, as a society. You look around, you might say, it don't look like it, but don't look around. I talk to people, and I, I talk to, constantly, I'm always talking to different people. Most of them are in religion. I was talking to an older gentleman this week. He's in his mid-80s. And he's still healthy. He still likes to farm a little bit. And uh, he said, you know, he, uh, we were talking about oysters. I said, you know, I really like raw oysters on a cracker with good hot sauce. And he said, you know, he said, I can tell you this, but I can't tell nobody else this. This guy's a trustee in the Baptist church. He's a deacon in the Baptist church. He's a teacher in the Baptist church. <laughs> he's just not the preacher. Outstanding guy. He said, you know, I just love oysters and a cold beer. <laughs> I said, I said, Leo, you're kidding me. He said, man, I do. He said, I, if, every time I get good raw oysters, I have to have a cold beer. And I said, but you don't tell your deacon board that, do you? He said, oh, God, no. Don't tell none of them. <laughs> I said, so probably Leo, all the same you, you're a closet beer drinker. <laughs> I thought, you know, it's sad. That the majority of them are that way. They can't right, go and enjoy right. a cold beer with a raw oyster because the, they're going to get condemned. They're going to get knocked down and beat down. I said, well, 
That's what religion has done for us. And it's done, it, it's done a job on us and many times we don't recognize it. And it's hard to break ourselves from that kind of religious bondage. But uh, I think we are beginning to do that. We're, we're beginning to break ourselves free from it. Okay, let me read you these notes that I wrote and then I'm going to kind of delve into these notes a little bit. The ancient philosophers and philosophy, philo, Greek philo means love, sophi means wisdom. So philosophy is the love for wisdom. That's what supposedly the idea behind the philosophers. The philosophers were 2,000 years ago what a quantum science is today. They didn't even have the word scientist 2,000 years ago. They had the word philosophers. And so the philosophers were those who sought out the wisdom that's in nature. And so basically that's what a quantum science is doing too. It's trying to figure out how nature really works, how it does what it does. Because what it does is miraculous. And, and, but it does it anyway. So the ancient philosophers, or wisdom keepers, had dozens upon dozens of ways to tell how energy slash power, these are words I'm trying to work with to get people to think out of the box, energy slash power, or essence slash God. And you, all of them can be interchanged. And really I'm trying to take for me, the word God into a place where we can understand it as the all in all. But we can't take our Christianized word God and understand it as the all in all. Because we have taken the word God and made it into an old gray-headed man. So therefore, as an old man out there somewhere, it can't be all in all. So we have made that huge gap between what God and all in all is. But if you can understand these words, and there are many different words that you can use, power, essence, energy, source, and the list goes on that many people using interchangeably to try to communicate in natural terms this that's hard to communicate in unnatural terms. You know, I know you get that here, so... So I'm saying these different words. That the ancient philosophers had dozens upon dozens of ways to tell how energy slash power or essence slash God has its way. It being him and or her or it being androgynous. And see if I said, if I talked about God and I said God is both male and female, or if I talked about Mother God as opposed to Father God, people get upset. People get bent out of shape because they can't understand. But if you got, if you look at the all in all, then you realize the all in all is androgynous. It's both and. And so therefore to call it it is it seems like disrespect, especially to the religious mind, but it's not. So its ability to manifest that thing we call life. Mm. Mm. That thing we, you and I, call life. Not what we think. It's not what we think. What we call life is material manifestation. You see, we have a terminology, we have terminology problems, and I re I realize that and recognize it constantly because of my southern slang, and I realize my terminologies in southern slangs, and I get to slinging words, preaching, and my all my words run together, and I say words that are plain southern words, but when they get up north or out west, they hear like, what did he mean when he said that? What is that word? I make up words like snot. That means it's not. So if I'm in a hurry and I say it's not. Yeah. That means it is not. But it sounds like snot. Yeah. <laughs> I say that. I say that all the time. You know what I mean, don't you? Sure, we, we understand it. 
and you know, I get in a big way, and I realize words have to be able to communicate and carry. And so I get all and and excited about run my words together, you know. And uh, I think about it after a while, a while of preaching. But we call this life. But when we look at life and we read about life in Scripture, then we have to designate two different things. And one way we do that is eternal life as opposed to temporal life. And so then we take the word life and we designate it separate ways and think that I don't have eternal life because all i got is physical life rather than to realize I have life that is eternal and temporal. But you see, we again have these problems to communicate and to try to hear what scripture or philosophical writings are saying. Y'all understand yeah. what I'm saying? So, its ability, i.e., in other words, the all in all, its ability to manifest that thing which we call life, it's not what we think. What we call life is material manifest existence. In other words, you look at me and say, I'm alive. Now, if you come to my uh, funeral, then you know what you would say? He's dead. But the physical body is just a carcass or a carrier or a suit that I wear to, what? to house life. So life didn't stop just because I laid the suit down, just because my physical body... I left it. Life didn't stop. See, that's that's a that's a conundrum. That's something that we have a real difficult time grasping. So here's what we do: in in the in the physical material world, it is life and death. Life and death is life. It's like, for instance, this Hebrew word right here. If you or this Hebrew glyph. This is the very first one. If you look up that glyph, that's the Aleph. And that is, of course, number one. And that Aleph number one is the glyph in ancient Hebrew that stands for this all in all. We call it God. But here's what this glyph means. It means life and death. Life and death. That's what that glyph means. Why? Because... This glyph is taken out of this. It's taken out of the symbol of the circle, which is a circle, and in, in this in Hebrew is called in. A-Y-N-R-A-I-N. Either way you want to say it. It's called in. And so in is referring to the vast no thing that is everything. So it's not saying that there's nothing. It's saying the no thing is everything. It's saying that the no thing is the all in all. So the circle then becomes the key to the window into what we call eternal. Now we have a word that's been grossly, grossly misused and misunderstood. And it is this word right here. Heaven, which we understand it as this word right here. Space. And I'm going to talk a lot more about space. And I'll talk some about heaven because we've got to reclaim words in their original meaning so we understand what they say. Because if I'm talking about heaven and earth, I'm not talking about some majestic paradise out, out yonder somewhere in space, in space, that they've told you and me exists, and one day I'll get to go there if I'm good. That's why most all churches are filled with older people. Do you know why? They have been hammered and hammered their whole life that they're getting close to that threshold that they think they're fixing to die. And so God, they won't <laughs> hold on to that place they think they're going to get to go to. Churches aren't filled with young people. 
They just aren't there. Now, churches that do have some young people offer programs for young people. That's the reason they go there. But most churches, the backbone of most churches, are the older folks. <laughs> Old people. Why? It's not because they're enjoying life. It's because they're afraid. They're scared to death thinking they ain't going to get life. You understand? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's all true. And it's, it's really bizarre what we have allowed to happen to us. And I, I mean, I love Alvin Boyd Coon. I, he's so wordy. I realize when I even mention his books and, and tell people about it, I realize you're going to have a difficult time reading him. And I know that up front. And because he is so wordy, he was a linguist. He had a grasp of language. He could take words and use words. And I'm sitting there, what does that mean? So I have, I'm reading him, and I have a dictionary in this hand. I have his book in this hand. I got to read, oh, I got to look at it. <laughs> you know, that's how it is. But for some reason, that works okay for me. And it just really resonates. So his writings work wonderful for me. But I don't necessarily recommend you read his stuff. It's really difficult to read. But it's wonderful once you get it. When you start to get it, oh, God. But, but we have got to come by because words paint pictures. And if your word heaven has painted you a picture of an ethereal place of paradise out in the future, and you don't realize that the ancient Hebrew word heaven actually is referring to you, the two <coughs> aspects of your being, <coughs> divine and the human. And, and you know, and the Hebrew glyph broken down for heaven is easy to, easy to see. So, the ability to manifest that thing which we call life. It's not what we think, but what we call life is material manifest existence. And it is life and death. Now, I want you to get these terms. I put these terms together because... To me, they, they, these terms have some things that I want you to hear communicated. Life and death. And I'd like to take death and put a different picture on it than what we have been told. Actually, it could be called a new beginning. Because we have such a low, gross understanding of death. The only thing that ever Scripture talks about that experienced death or that was dead, or that died, was actually the soul slash spirit. That's the only thing. It's not referring to the physical body and its ability to recycle. All of nature shows us that continuously. It shows us that ability. But the fact that we have misunderstood that phrase, death, die, or dead, and it always is referring to the eternal, the spirit, that put itself in limbo or death to come into a material temporal existence. But yet at the same time live in that existence submitted to this existence. That is a phenomenal thing if you think about it. So what I just said is that you have the all in all in you with all of its potential in you to do whatever you desire to do. And our problem is because we lack the truth, the knowledge of the truth, we've been inundated with religious garbage, we constantly destroy ourselves by the power of God that's in ourselves and don't know it. Don't know how to do anything about it, but we do it to ourselves and want to what? Well, bless God, it's the devil that did it. The devil did it to me. Yeah, okay. So listen to these words. Life and death. Push and pull. Which is easy. Is it easier to push or pull? Up and down. Is it easier to go up or go down? These are just terms that I put these. And now here's one that I put together, and I would love to shout on this one on the rooftop in front of every television screen and, and just let millions and billions of people hear this, and it's called ease and struggle. Most of us get really stuck in the struggle and live a life constantly in the struggle, not realizing we could live it in the ease by our own choosing. Heaven and hell. 
These are these all of these words I put together are what called contrasts, or another word I use conundrum, because they are they appear to be a conundrum, and as you can do to yourself whatever you really choose to do to yourself. Here is here's the rub. If you're going to take it easy down a hill, you have to get the discipline and the strength to get up the hill. If you and I want to understand what the push and the pull is about, then you have to put the discipline in your life to do the push. You hear what I'm saying? I hope you can get this. If you want to, if you really want to enjoy the ease, then you've got to struggle to get through the discipline. Now what we want is we want it on Easy Street all the time. You know, I hear this constantly all day. This young group today, they don't understand the ideology that we have of work. <laughs> a dirty word, a dirty work. Well, that's how everything comes about. Is you are doing a work whether you realize or recognize you're not doing any work. If you're doing nothing, then you're working hard at nothing and nothing will ever get you anywhere. It's just that way. That is work. However, whatever you want to look at it, that's work. But discipline is a is a really a nasty, dirty word because people don't understand discipline is the struggle to get you to ease. If you get so far in discipline, it comes to a point that discipline is no longer hard to do. It just becomes habitual. It becomes first nature to be and do these things. Your very life that you have in this physical body is a witness to the things I'm trying to say. Your heart does it naturally, pushes and pulls. Your heart is constantly struggling and ease. Your lungs are doing the same thing. Inhale, exhale. Same, and that's how that's how this dimension works. If we can understand some of the basic principles of this dimension that have been stolen from us, the philosophies, these different dozens and dozens of ways to say the same thing. I'm going to throw you some out here in just a minute. And I realize the religious ears have a hard time with what I'm about to read. But the dozens and dozens of ways to say the same thing. And what they're saying is about this thing we call life. Pushing and pulling. Ease and struggle. We live most of our life and then we never, we never pay attention to what we say. Many times don't pay attention to what we do. And then we wonder why this happens. Why did this happen to me? What's happening? The dozens of ways the ancient sages explained how these things happened was through their mythologies, their allegories, their tales, their stories, the different things that they do. And so right here, I'm going to, I'm going to read a book. This is by a medical doctor. His name is Rhino. And this book was written in 1910. And I want to read you some of the things that he said out of the content. I don't want to just the... In the contents of the book. I'm not going to read you all he says in this little book. I think the little book got about 160 pages, 150 pages. Uh, yeah, 130, 138 or so pages. The content of what he says about these, these are what's called mythologies. And again, I would like to reclaim the true meaning of a myth. I hear people constantly talk about a myth and they think a myth is just a lie. That's sad. That is really sad. When in truth, 2,000, 3,000, 8,000 years ago, a myth was one of the most phenomenal things you could get a hold of because if a myth teller could tell the story the way it was intended to be told, that story would be told with power so that in that story it would ignite in you that power and would cause you to come alive with energy. That's what a myth is. A myth is something that you connect to, something that when you hear it, it energizes you. It, it resurrects you. It makes you want to run the aisles. You know what I'm talking about? So now, here's what he says, and these are the stories. This first one 
is the God. This one goes back over 8,000 years. This one was called the God Amin. That's what he was called. And he was from the Ammonians. That was, that's what they were called, the Ammonians. From, from the word, you've heard this word probably, you can find it in the, in the Hebrew Bible, Ammon. So from that word Ammon, the word Amin. And Amin was the story of a God, the Son of God, that died and rose again. That was the story of Amin. The next one is the story of the God, B-A-C-C-H-U-S, Bacchus. The story of the God Bacchus. Now probably that's beginning to that's beginning to rattle your ears. Not that the word amen, we call it amen. You know, you know, in Christianity we call it, and it's all in, in Greek mythology, amen. And so we think that amen actually means that if I say a prayer to God the Father and I put the signature signing of that prayer in Jesus' name, amen, that means that God's going to do it. But 99.9, .9, no, let me rephrase that, 9,000, no, let me rephrase that. 90,999 of people's prayers that are prayed like that in Jesus' name, amen, don't ever happen. They don't. I would to God that they did, but they don't. The majority of them don't ever happen. And you know what they say? Well, God didn't hear me, or God didn't want it, or why did you even waste your time? <coughs> you know? And I realize that sounds, I don't want to be that disrespectful, but because, but where they're using this word, I'm just trying to get you to understand. You know why they were using that word, Amen? From this ideology of over 8,000 years ago from the Ammonians. You can go, you can do that Google it or whatever, and you'll find the root of this particular word. It's in the New Testament. That's what it was referring to. Bacchus. Again, same God. Uh, this is a, a Roman, a Roman God, Bacchus. The story of, of Bacchus was he's virgin born. Bacchus went into ministry. He was a, called the Savior of the world. He was called the resurrect, the death and resurrected Son of God. His name was Bacchus. Here's another one: the God. And I have a book that's called the, the 36, let's see, I, the title of the 16 dead, dead and Resurrected Sons of God, something like that. This one is called the God Krishna or Krishna. And I know you've probably heard of that one, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Krishna, that was the Hindu. That was the Indian God. And he was the Son of God. He was also called the Savior of the world. And he was also called the dead and resurrected one. Now, the, the thing about all of these gods, and I can go on, like I said, I have a book that talks about 16, but it also lists 36, 32 or 36 that have the same story told a little bit different. And then, of course, this one that we are familiar with. And then here's another one that we are less familiar with. We're familiar with that one, Jesus. Less familiar with that one, Horace. But some of us have heard of that. And the thing about this, did you realize that this J wasn't even, there was no Jesus until the German Bible. Did y'all know that? There was no J. There is no J in, in some of the ancient. You know what this was? Germans changed this H to a J. So what's the difference between H-E-S-U-S, Hesus, and H-O-R-U-S, Horus? None. It's the same identical story character. Same story, same character. Now again, then people said, Holy oh, Brother Lynn, you don't believe in a real Jesus. I didn't even say that. I'm not even, that's not even my 
in my thinking at all. I didn't say that. I don't mean that. I just simply mean it's ignorance has gone to seed and we're so ignorant to the truth that we're afraid to, to shine lights on something we've been told not to believe. I, I mean, I can remember nearly 40 years back when I was doing a lot of my what we call theological studies or seminary studies, I can remember just really just pouring myself over a book called The Kingdom of the Cults by Dr. Walter Martin. It was really popular back then, 40-something, 40 40-plus 40 years ago. And I poured myself over that book, and it began to tell me about all these de the demonic things in it. It told me about some of these characters right here, these story characters, and it told me that these were concocted by the devil pre-Jesus to detour us from the truth. That is about as dumb as Gord. To, to try to sell a lie. That, and we bought, we bought it. I bought it. I did for a long time, for quite a few years. Anyway, I will, I will stop right there. All of these characters, <coughs> all of them say the same thing. All of them tell the same story. And that story is about the son, the S-U-N, on its journey around this circle, and the cardinal cross. And it starts out right here on this one. Aries, the sign of the the sign of the lamb or the sign of the ram, whichever, whichever you like. I want to get the proportion of that a little better. That's better. And this one's Aries. This is the Passover right here. And of course, uh, okay. And we're all familiar with that. That's the uh, head of the lamb, the ram, and all that. Okay, let me read you. Let me read you another note right here, so I can move on. I'm dragging this out a little longer than I wanted to. Uh, when we look, when we, we look up or out, or if I'm looking. If I'm looking at this back wall, I see the wall. But I don't see anything between here and the wall unless if I'm looking at you. If I'm not looking at you and I'm just looking at the back wall, I don't see anything between here and the, and the back wall at all. Does that mean there's nothing there? No. So what do I call this between the wall and where I'm standing? What do I call that? I call that space. That's what I call it. And usually I'll say there's nothing in space. And then if I go at night and I look up into the stars, I call that outer space. That's, that's, that's what I call that. So when we look out and look into space, we see at night, we can see the planets, the stars, etc. Isn't that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, and we, call, we can call it, and we do call that space or outer space, don't we? And, and now that we've got movies all about it, okay. So, and if you look at this word space, and I did this, and here's what it said. Number one was the distance between points of objects. The distance between points or objects. In other words, if I said from here to the road, I put a distance on it. Now, what I did is I put space in time by doing that. I put space in time. If I look at from here to the wall, I did it again the same way. I put space in measurement. You got me? You understand? Yeah. So that's what it's the distance between points or objects. Now, it, number two, it was it meant unlimited room in all directions. It's called space. Unlimited room in all directions. Yet throughout time, space. Because well, see, space encompasses time. Yet throughout time, we have had and we still have philosophers, mathematicians, metaphysicists, astrologers give us all kinds of ideas about space. In other words, all of these characters deal with this idea of space. Give us all kinds of ideas about space. Yet, we don't understand what space is. We could call it a place of nothing. What is between you and there? Space. 
We call it empty space. Y'all said that before? Mm -hmm. Empty space. Why? Because we don't see anything with our physical eye. Does that mean that there's nothing there? For instance, I can remember here when we were a big, full-blown, charismatic church, hundreds of people here, and I can remember having some phenomenal worship service that we did have. We had phenomenal worship service because we had a we had a phenomenal praise man. We had a, a team of men and women that just were talented and anointed and did a tremendous job. And I can remember standing here and just my eyes closed and worshiping God. I, I loved that. I enjoyed doing that, you know. And I've even run and dance and do all that stuff, you know, jump up and down and get turn about, jump up around. <laughs> Do the hokey pokey and <laughs> we did all that stuff. But I can remember this. I remember just like it was. I can remember all of a sudden just and nothing happened. And all of a sudden it felt like whoosh, a wind just flushed right, right in front of me. There ain't nothing there. You hear it? No, it's just empty space. Where'd that wind come from? Because it. Now y'all shaking your head. You felt the same thing happen. Where did it come from? It was something there. It was something. It just the brush of an angel's wing. Isn't that what we call it? Come out of empty space. But it was always there. It's all. It, you know, remember that song? He is there all the time. I just didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So we call that empty space, but it's not empty. The space. It's not where there's nothing there. The space is where everything is there. If you can get that, everything <coughs> is there. Potentiality is there. Power is there. What is it doing? It's there waiting to awaken that same potential and power that's already in me. How did he get there? I drew out of nothing space, air, spirit. Where did I take it? I took it into, and it, you know where it went? Just through a breath. You know where it went? It went right to the marrow of my bone. It does it for everybody. Everything. Everything is living, breathing. So actually, this place that we call space is where light, I hope you get it, it's caught with where this place, it's where light or vibration, that's what light is, Vibration is this. Vibration is uh, this thing that moves like this. And you know what you know what that's called, don't you? That's called a sine wave. Vibration. That's light. It's from that. Now listen to this. It says that it's a place that we call space, but it's where sound. Sound is just vibration. They, you know, they, they know that. They've proven that. It's a place that we call space. It's where color. That's what color is. Color is vibration. Everything comes from this place that we call space or no thing. So for us to call space heaven is a gross misuse of words. But yet we do. We constantly do. And by doing that, we miss most all the things that we need to get about space. Now I'm going to read you something from this book. It's a Secret Doctrine, Volume 3 by uh, Madame Blavatsky. This book was actually compiled after her death, but it was about the uh, it was about the notes that she had put together for this book, and then another uh, group of people put it together for her. Uh, Goodness, let me see where do I want to read this. So much in this book that I'd like to read to you, but I'll try not to. It's just so much. Um, Creators of the cosmos. 
as all visible nature, if not of all the invisible hosts of spirits. I want you to hear that word host. You remember I've been talking about the word host and understand what the hosts are. Because the hosts are all of the angles of the sun as it travels. This is the path of the sun. It's called the ecliptic. And actually it's uh, 16 degrees, 8 degrees above or 8 degrees below this sign. This this this. Equa, equa, equator, this, this uh, line. Eight degrees below it or eight degrees above it, which gives you 16 degrees. So, I mean, it's so much built off of those, those numbers. Eight, 16, 32. I mean, you know, 32 degrees in masonry, 32, 32 steps in the, cap, in the Kabbalah's tree of life. All of these things aren't different they're all the same thing, saying it different. Just telling the same story, but tell it a different way. So if I'm talking about the ecliptic, and I'm talking about the sun, it's all about the sun, S-U-N. All of the stories are about the S-U-N. And many times the S-U-N is called the S-O-N. And when it's referred to the S-O-N, actually it should be the child. Because it would be either a man or a woman, not just a boy. You hear what I'm saying? I mean, we have we have taken the women and just cast them out like they're just uh, they're our play toy, or our servant, or whatever, you know. Because we take this word son, S O N, and we try to say, well, it's only the boys, it's, it's the men. God's only interested in them. And that, many religions are built that way, and you know that they are. Why? Because of era of just words, not. Just taking that one word, the S-O-N, which more properly could have been the child, because the child can be a boy or girl. So he goes on and he says, uh, the real creators of the cosmos are all visible and unnoticed, or millions and millions of imperfect works found in nature testify loudly that they are products of finite conditioning beings. Though the latter were, wh where are the Dayon Kohans or Archangels or whatever else they may be named? These are different names to say the same thing. This would be called an Archangel. Or Archangel. Either way. Because it is an angle that the sun is passing through and in that movement it creates a certain energy. For instance, if you took... If you took your corn or your tomatoes or your squash and this uh, November, you put it in the same identical ground that you put it in now, what would happen to it? It wouldn't grow. wouldn't do anything. wouldn't produce anything at all. It wouldn't even come up out of the ground. It's the same ground. You put the same water on it, what's the difference? There's only one difference. What is it? See? The S-U-N. The sun. The sun's still out there. But that's the only difference. It's the position of the sun at that time. Because in November, the position of the sun, as it is right now, is different. So what does the position of it do? It changes the temperature of it. The heat of it. Because you can put that, you put that corn and over in the ground come November, I promise you, you're just wasting your seed. You just throw your seed to the swine. In short, these imperfect works are the unfinished products of evolution under the guidance of imperfect gods. And you can understand that these angles or angels are called the same thing as the gods, G-O-D-S, which are the Hebrew Elohim. We can get that. We understand that. The answer is here in the hosts, in the angles. And the many different things that they're called. Uh, the, the Zohar gives us this assurance as well as the secret doctrine. It speaks of the auxiliaries or the ancient of days. You've heard that term, haven't you? Or the sacred aged. Or it calls them the 
Ayupium are the living wheels, you've heard that term, wheels of celestial orbs. Have you ever heard of a wheel in a wheel? Mm -hmm. I know you have. You've yeah. been in church all your life and read the book of Ezekiel. All of these participate in the work of creation in the universe. Thus, it is not the principle one of unconditioned nor even its reflection that creates, but only the seven gods that create. And the seven would just simply be those right there. Those are the seven months of summer and those are what we would call the, the spring. And summer. And this was how the ancients saw it. They saw it spring and summer and winter. They didn't, they didn't divide it into the four seasons that we have now. It can go either way. It can be divided into the four seasons. But when you understand it and you look at it in this direction and you begin to see the one, two, three, four, five, five months of winter, which are cold, and seven months of spring and summer, this is where life is, this is where death is. But you've got to understand, those are not literal terms. Those are terms that are trying to communicate deep spiritual truths. So if I understand that push and pull, life and death, up and down, summer and winter are all referring to the same thing. And I can put them in this place I understand this space, I realize that I'm the creator of my world. And God has given me that ability. So I want to read you a note right here that I wrote, and then I want to read one other thing, and I'm going to try to quit or close this back, or if you have some questions, let's try to get into them. If we get the most important word in the Bible wrong, in other words, God, we have built our whole ideology on a false or a wrong foundation. In other words, God, or Elohim, that's the word most of the time used, over 2,000, 24, 2,500 times in the Bible, the word God is Elohim, the most predominant word in the Bible, God, Elohim. Hebrew, Elohim, always is referring to the seven creative spheres of life. In other words, the spring summer time. The time that causes the, the life to flourish on the earth. That's what it's always referring to. The Elohim, the gods, or the power, or it's called fire. In some places it's called fire. Matter of fact, let's see. I think she actually says it here. Yeah, the word Elohim, she gives it and breaks it down into its numeric value. And here's what she calls it. She calls it violent heat. And she also calls it the power of fire. And I'll show you that in just a minute. And you'll, I hope that you'll be able to see what I'm trying to say. The gods are the power of fire. Or the mother of formation. The mother of formation. The thing about the woman's womb is the heat that's produced when the seed is in it. The heat is the fire that grows it. And you, you know that, okay? Uh, or the mother, the mother of formation. The Elohim is not one God, nor two, nor even three, but it's called the hosts. And when you incorporate that word Elohim as the hosts, you don't just incorporate it as the seven creative spheres. And you think about that word seven, that's a universal word. There's seven endocrine glands, there's seven churches, there's seven colors, there's seven sounds. All of those are basic terms. Seven lights on the candlestick. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. It's not only when it talks about the host, it's not only talking about the seven creative spheres of the Elohim, it's also talking about the five to give it the total of twelve. 
good completion of the whole thing. So it says, uh, uh, that, uh, not, uh, this is the notes that I wrote. Not, the Elohim is not one God nor two, nor even three, but is the host, Genesis 2.1. The many, the twelve, and its base that create the 360 degrees in the circle. In other words, it's the hosts of space. And again, when I say that, space, it don't mean there's nothing there. Y'all don't mind. It's everything there. It's the host of space. And then I wrote a note here. Let me read you this, this right here. This is a note that she's quoting from another person. Uh, let's see if I can find out who this was. This was an, another book. It's quoted out of another book. And here's what it's the worshipers of the teraphim. You can read about the teraphim in the book of Judges, in the Bible, King James Bible. It comes from the word Terah, who was Abraham's father, talked about in Genesis chapter 11. And it's talked about that Terah was, his occupation was, he was the creator of idols. And so what we're told as the creator of idols, they were false gods. That's not true. What they were, the better word for a teraphim or this we call idol is an image. That's what these are. These are all images. And what that really means behind it is that the image, if you gaze upon the image with the intent to understand it's not that image, that image is just the reflection of the power itself. So it's just a reminder. And you do that all the time. I do that all the time. You make notes to remind yourself. You don't worship the note, do you? What you do after you do, after you've done what you were going to do is on the note. Throw it away. Trash it. You didn't bow down to it. You didn't kiss it. You didn't need to. Why? It's just a reminder. That's exactly what the terror films were. They were reminders. They were notes to show you. They were notes to call you back to attention. You know why? Because when you're going down easy street, you know what you wind up doing? <laughs> you forgot the struggle it was to get there. And so here you go. Whoa. I mean, we just roller coaster. Not thinking. How did I get here? We don't remember. The worshipers of the teraphim claim that the light of the principal star or planets penetrating into and filling the, the whatever, the image, or the reminder through and through that was the angelic virtue or it was the regents or the animating principle behind the planets. That just rings in me. The animating principle that's behind this configuration of the planet. Do you get that? The animate that means that something is coming from there into here and it is a principle of life and power to me. And if I can get that, I can remember that then hey, I understand that. And I don't, I don't worship the note. I use the note and thank it for my, my greater good. So it's, and this is what he's saying that they did that. They, they used those teraphims and they are just a part of the hosts or the Elohims or the gods. Uh, thus, the host is represented by the different angles or angels that give them such as the teraphim, the seraphim, the cherubim, the nephilim, and there's 12 of those names to coincide with the 12 astrological signs, to coincide with the 12 apostles, to coincide with the 12 sons of Jacob, to coincide with the 12 foundations of the city. You understand? See, you get that? It, it's just over and over. Saying the same thing, but say it many different ways to so that we are sometimes slower dense, but so we can get it. <laughs> so it was the teraphim, the seraphim, the cherubim, the nephilim, and, and all the other hymns. 
representing its different angles and power of fire that give that that are given another name. And uh, I'm not going to go into the other names. I'm just going to use one one passage of scripture. And if you will turn over there with me, the Book of Genesis. I said all that. Then you get to the Bible. The book of Genesis chapter 2. You get to where the place where you come from. Genesis chapter 2. Okay. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And what what you see there is the constructive idea, blueprint, design for a physical body. That's what that basically that's so again it says the heavens and the earth. To come back again to reclaim the true meaning of the word heaven and the true meaning of the Hebrew word earth. Earth actually from the Hebrew actually means the constructive power of the physical elements to build you. Okay? Not the dirt, but the different miracle substances that are here to build you. That's what those three glyphs in the Hebrew word earth is about. Okay? Aretz. It's the alif, which is the divine. The resh, the resh, the fire, the heat, and the tall, the time, the last glyph in Hebrew. Okay? That's, and then heaven, sheen mem, yod mem, sheen mem, waters above, yod mem, waters below. The two physical aspects. So to reclaim those and not to put heaven and earth in space. Other than it's encompassed in space, but to, to come back to that place. So he says, verse 1, that the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. All of this right here is what he's referring to. All of these powers, angles, angels, energies, etc. All of them. And then drop down to verse 7. This is a, the last word I want you to get. And the, and the Lord God formed man of the dust. The dust. The word dust. It's the Hebrew. Dust. This is called, this glyph right here is called the ayin. It means the eye of God. G-O-D. It's the eye of God. And this is called the fei. It has an A value. And this has eternal, it has an A value, but it has, it's referring to the eternal motion of this right here. See, this is summer, and this goes right on around, and when you when you actually put this together you know, in a different way, uh, let me do it, it should be this way, would help us to understand this better. Let me do it this way. And really, this is spring and this is fall. It comes right back around again, what? Spring again. So that sine wave is just, it's like uh, if I was standing right here at fall and then I come all the way back around, it's the same thing. It's just the flip side of it. <laughs> so this actually makes this. This sine wave makes this circle move. So you start here, you don't end here. You start in spring, you don't end in fall. You go back to spring. So you make a perpetual circle. So you, you, you incorporate eternity. So that's what this particular glyph means, faith. 
has a duality, so it's eternal, the eight. That's you can Google, you can Google the path of the sun on your cell phone, and it looks like this. It's called the that's called the symbol of eternity, right? The symbol of eternity. Mm -hmm. And it uh, actually should be larger at the top than it is at the bottom, really. Like that. Because this would be spring. This would be summer. We are. This would be fall. And this would be winter. The four seasons. Right, and this is this this uh, sine wave is this and all the same thing. So if I just drew an eight or a sine wave or a circle, I, I can it's the same thing. So and what if I call this by one name? What if I call this one right here Bacchus? What if I call this one right here Jesus? It's the same thing, but just saying it in different ways. So the I this is the word for dust. I tell people actually this word is translated dust in Hebrew, and when you read it, what do you think about? You think about dirt. You know, and that's <laughs> I remember I used to tell the story. I said, What people see in their minds is they see this old gray headed guy silhouetted back up into heaven so he don't have a body, but he's got a head sticking down here, two arms, playing in the mud ball, in a mud puddle. In that mud puddle, he's working, and all of a sudden he makes his mud guy. He stands him up. He's naked as a jaybird. Stands him up right there. He's a he's a clay mud ball thing. God's done all this with this, and then God goes, blow me in his nostrils, and he went just streaking naked. That's pretty much what people. That's what they they read that. That's what they get. That is not at all what it's about, and that's not what this means. That's not what this word does mean. And then you get to the last glyph right here. This is the rash or the two hundred. This is the fire. So you have the eye of God, which he uses to see in man. And then you have the eternal energy, eternal life of God that's in it with the fire of the Spirit of God. And that's called dust. It's the Hebrew word afar. And actually, it's referring to light particles. Quantum science has proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that every one of us are made up of light particles. It's just who we are. Okay, I'll quit. I'm not through, but I'll quit. <laughs> All right, any questions or any? Is, is that clear? Ms. Bell? I know I've asked this question different times, and then I'm trying to put the two spots together with because of the angels and the hosts and um, um, how the Catholic Church has the different uh, saints in uh, worship and I see all the different angels that there's angel books and these angels talk to human beings and they um, anyway so if they're aspects of my God, of who I am, of all the different seasons and everything, uh, and uh, one particular thought or energy is given to this angel that talks to people, and that uh, it still can be God um, letting that pr who's praying and asking for revelation that He brings them this understanding of this particular aspect. I'm trying to bring uh, what I've understood through the years together. I'm seeing that and I say amen and amen, but I'm trying to say, well, how can I bring my past of what I've known I'm able to be and the host and the different understandings together in that? So I don't know if you can. You've been saying it the whole time, I know, but still I can't seem like I can bring it together to make a spark of understanding, to explode that <laughs> wrong thinking that I've had so many years. And then and well, put the two and two together. Well, any one of these angles right here, any one of these angles, yeah. and they have an angelic name. Yes. Okay, an angle. 
Yes. Now, this let's just set this on like if it were a clock, a 12 hour clock. So this is going to be 12 noon, right? Yes. And so during this period of time, between 12 and 1, the sun is going to be in this angle in the astrological zodiacal Maseroth wheel. The wheel of Ezekiel. So during this time of the day, 12 to 1, during this particular time of the year, this angle is speaking. And it's doing that through vibrational energy. So you can put yourself in a state of mind that you could probably hear things said to you during that time. Now you could say, well, that was the angel that came to me and spoke yeah. at that time. Yeah. And that's not wrong. That's, that's not in error. That's true. You could probably even put yourself into a place to where that, that energy can configuratively appear to be something. You know, I, I hear some people say, well, it's the configuration of the clouds. <coughs> They're the angels. Well, that's fine if you want to, if you want to do that. That's fine. I, I don't have any problem with that. I, I, you could call it a gnome or a salamander. Or different, see, they do, they do different kinds of names, and then people get stuck on those places. It doesn't matter to me what you're going to call it. The fact of the matter is, it is a part of the host. It's one-twelfth of the host. It can be called an angel. It can be called an angel. It can be called a seraphim. See, it can be any of those names. They're all, they're all saying the same thing, telling the same story, giving you the energy to be who you are. So, like for me, you know, one of my times is early in the mornings when I'm up in the early time and I'm getting the energy from this sun at an earlier time. Usually it's just through the window, through the through the wind window. That's the same thing as a window. <laughs> I remember when I pastored in Indiana. A lady from New Jersey, she called me Larry. I said, my name is spelled L-Y-N-N. -N. She said, I know Larry. I said, there ain't no R in it. I understand that, Larry. <laughs> but everything she had, everything that uh, those folks from New Jersey, everything just about got an R in it. So, uh, anyway, these different angles represents those aspects of energy. And so they're same, same, but different ways. Does that make sense? Well, my cousin who's Catholic, uh, there's an angel, angel, that she prays to when there's sickness and that, and she really feels that she has heard from this particular aspect of God when she prays in that. Uh, I don't know if it's Michael, it doesn't matter in that, but... Um, um, well, see, in Catholicism, you probably have more teaching of these angels. Yes. Not as angels, but as angels. And what you would do in Catholicism, instead of taking these 12 angels in a circular fashion, you just line up across here and give you 12 different names, 12 different characters, look like it's 12 different disciples, and then pick you out one or two of them. Say, that's my favorite one right there. Mm -hmm. I like Michael, or I like Gabriel, or I like, mm -hmm. you know, just whichever one that you like and give him a different name. And that's the one that you get your energy from. But that's, I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying that's how we were taught to recognize this. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Catholic Church wants you to recognize it in the wheel, in the astrological signs. They just want you to say, well, there's 12 archangels, angels. Mm -hmm. They want you to just think that. It's just tw there's 12 of them, mm -hmm. and they're in command. You know, they're, yeah. And uh, Lucifer was one of them, and he fell from his high and lofty place. So there's just 11 out there right now. And they're working on your behalf. So, 
what's amazing. It's just absolutely phenomenal how everything got distorted. Yeah, it's, it is. Uh, a lot of the ancient truth is very distorted through religion. It really is. 